Chairman Board of Governors, Dr. Modi, Director of the Institute, Dr. Bishwas, faculty members, members of the Senate, and so on, visitors and guests, and most importantly, the graduating class. I am very happy to be here. I have belonged to the IIT family for many years. I belonged to the first IIT when we were just starting in the year 1951-52, that period, just for a short time. Then I was a professor in IIT Kanpur for many years. One thing I have learned, IIT is the only brand India has created after freedom. You guys and girls and boys here, remember, the only brand India has created is what you have now. So don't shake it off as something extra. Be proud of it. Use it. You have to use it. If you say IIT, you get a bit more salary. If you say IIT, you get more opportunity. People want IIT graduates. In fact, I always say, if all those brilliant students I taught at IIT Kanpur, if only they worked for the good of the country, India would have changed. Unfortunately, they did other things. So if IIT students with that brand value and that education really decide to serve this country, we have no worry about the future. IIT here in Guwahati is a relatively new IIT, but has come up very nicely. It is one of the top IITs coming up very nicely with a great future. I think I want to congratulate Gautam Bishwas for having done a wonderful job in the last few years to improve the academic content and the academic future of this great upcoming IIT. When I was in IIT Bombay addressing a couple of thousand students, they all wanted me to talk to them. I, I talked about science, about all kinds of things, what I do in life, what one can do in life. Then they asked me in the end, give me a short message, one message to the young people, what they should do. Well, I said, nothing. It is a very short message I can give you. I told them, I'll repeat that. All you have to do is to decide what you want to do in life. Most people don't decide it till they die. They have never decided what they want to do. They go on as life, as things come along, they pick up this, pick up that, wander around, roam around, but not decide what is they want to do. Please decide now what you want to be, and you will be that. Because all you require, I told the IIT Bombay students, is what I call dedication, doggedness, and tenacity. I didn't mention intelligence. I think you already have it. So I don't want to mention it again. But don't forget our forefathers, particularly Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela. How do you think they won the freedom for their countries? Not because of brilliance, they went to IIT. Because they had doggedness, they had dedication, they had tenacity. Don't ever forget that. Success is assured in India, even in this poor country. Some of us have made the grade working here. Some of, some of our colleagues, many of them outside the IIT system, have done well because of the tremendous qualities they produced. So remember, decide what your mission is, and success is assured. The only thing is I have to say something about the future on a day like this. How does the future look for India? Well, the short-term future and the long-term future. I tell you, the short-term future is easy to predict. Things will go on, something will happen, but the long-term future is difficult to predict. I can only see this in the intermediate future, which I see because I go all around the world. I just came back from my major conference in Singapore, where lots of people from all over the world were there. It was organized by the Royal Society of London. Where, what do I see? The people around the world, everybody wants to prosper. Everybody, every country wants to become top-notch in everything. Particularly, we are having problem with our two Asian neighbors, China. Unbelievable. The amount of money invested by them in education, the amount of money invested in technology development is unbelievable. The number of, if you go to a small, a small university, you say, how many professors are there in this department? I think we have 275 professors in one department. How many PhDs? We have 780 PhD students in this department. You know, all numbers, fright, staggering and frightening. I don't know, every janitor will have a PhD very soon. 
in China. Well, in fact, every time my wife and I go there, the people who are escorters, they chaperon, chaperon, all of, all of them have PhD with three years postdoctoral experience in America. They have no other job. They just they are all too many PhDs. They are going to produce. They are now producing 23,000 PhDs per year, and they plan to produce. My friend is now the president of the Japan Academy. Chun Li Bai keeps saying we are going to produce 30,000 PhDs in a few years. Oh my God! I am not impressed by that. That is not the main thing. But what is all interesting is they are now contributing nearly the same amount of research as United States. United States contributes about 17 percent of world research. China is almost 15 percent. That is also frightening. But even that doesn't bother me. What really bothers me is the great effort being made by particularly China and South Korea. Of course, Japan has always done that, to come up in quality so that they can compete with the best. Don't ever forget, this is something all our politicians should remember, all our industrialists should remember, that the future of mankind and future of India depend on science and technology. Those who are leaders in science and technology will rule the world. Then why, do you, why do you think America is number one? Is it because of the big army it has? No, no. It is because number one in science and technology. What do you think China is working for? They have already got the world's biggest army. No, that is not enough for them. They want to be number one in science and technology. We have to make India number one in science and technology. This is the role of IITs. This is the role of institutes that I have belonged to all my life. We have to do that to succeed. And that is the effort. It frightens me because population of India is still increasing. And we have lots of jobs to do, lots of competition. We have to succeed. So remember, it depends on you guys. I am sure you will succeed. Don't ever think that we cannot succeed. I think we will succeed. If the government really has, a, has reasonable, healthy policies, our industries, really become up, uh, very supportive. Our society gives the required moral support. I don't see why India cannot be on the top of the world in the years to come. Let me tell about myself for a few minutes. Well, you know, I have been doing research for the last two, oh, how many years? 66 years. I started uh, doing research when I just finished my undergraduate degree in 1951. I'm still doing it. I'm now 84 for the last 58 years I've been a professor in this country. I still publish lots of papers. I still produce lots of PhD students. I try to compete with the best in the world. My, my frame of reference is not India. In science, engineering, and technology, the frame of reference is not India. You have to be the best in the world. If you are not internationally competitive, there's no point. They'll say, it is like being Sultan in your own street. Be the Sultan of a bigger area. Maybe India, maybe the world. We have to be sultans of the world in science and technology. That is my ambition. Well, the reason I still go on publishing is, the reason I go on doing writing books, I've written for 52 books already, 1,600 research papers. We say, why are you doing that? Doing work and producing results in this country is a way of saying I'm alive. The day you stop doing it, you're dead. I hope you'll remember. Till the last day of your life, work. Till the last day of your life, contribute. Till the last day of your life, think of what you can do for this great country. Well, I want to say one or two things. I hope, I didn't plan to say this, but I, I, I just suddenly remember. Don't forget, even before India got freedom, we had extraordinary figures in India who did things without any support. Don't forget Jesse Bose in Calcutta. In the year 1895, did the experiment in telegraphy, which should have got a Nobel Prize. Nobody gave him government DST award. There was no IIT. There was no nothing. And how did he do that? How did Ramanujan, sitting in a miserable hole somewhere in South India, publish 3,000 theorems and conjectures in mathematics, and, and which still people are working on? Why? How? Why did he do that? That is tremendous inner urge. Tremendous excitement that comes out of the passion of a man to do something in this world in his field. C.V. Raman, I don't know whether you know this story. C.V. Raman, when he became an FRS, I've been an FRS for a very long time, fellow of the Royal Society. You know, how did he become? 
He was a senior accounts officer and assistant accountant general later under the British Financial Service. In Nagpur, when he was in this accounts department, it is during evenings working in the Nagpur Science College, he did all his work on acoustics. He became an FRS for that. No, he had no job as a scientist. How did he do his, get his Nobel Prize? Working at discovery of Raman effect in Calcutta. Most of the time, he was again in accounts department. Then, in the evenings, he went to Indian Association for the cultivation of science and made this great discovery. Because it was a bit later that Ashutosh Mukherjee gave him a job in Calcutta University. How did these people do that? It is amazing to think of this. If they can do it then, why can't we do it now? That's what I tell myself. I also think of other great names, like Faraday, with three years of schooling. He had started working because his father died. He did more science in his life than any other human being will ever do again. In, again. If somebody asks me, what is the greatest name in science? For all time, is Michael Faraday. He made so many discoveries that Roger Rutherford said, if only he lived in the 20th century, he would get at least five Nobel Prizes. I think four, definitely. He made the loss of electrolysis, he would have got it, discovered benzene in organic chemistry. He is the one most imp importantly, he also discovered electricity by induction. So a number of experiments he did, and even today, some of the experiments he did are so difficult to repeat. Very wonderful experiments, please. Simple experiments, new concepts coming out of it, unbelievable. Well, it was also a great, that great man was also a very, very simple, simple person. You know, greatness and simplicity should go together. That is why I'm quoting him. Don't forget that. Become great, don't act like you are, you are walking above the earth, one foot between you and ground. No, you have your feet on the ground. I think simplicity and greatness. If they don't go together, that greatness doesn't shine. And we in India should remember that. Because we have a lot of poor people, we have a lot of problems. Greatness, therefore, should only mean you have accomplished something. It does not mean you are different as a human being. Well, I should close. I do not know how to close this lecture. Because I feel one of you. I feel I belong to the IIT family even now. But it's a wonderful family to belong to. Don't forget this great family you have belonged to. Well, I will close with by saying something I remember uh, that C.V. Raman told me. Professor Raman, I was very close to him. He was the first one to recognize me in my life when I was a young man of 29. When I wrote my second book, he wrote to me, Dear Dr. Rao, I've seen your book on spectroscopy published by Academic Press New York. If you can write such a book, you should be a member of the academy in India. So he got me elected to the academy before I was 30 years old. Unbelievable. He was a great man. He always was going to me. But when, before he died, just a few weeks before he died, we had a meeting of the Indian Academy of Sciences, and he invited me. I was in IIT Kanpur then, 1970. He asked me, Professor Rao, you must come and give a talk in this academy. So I went there, gave a talk on the structure of liquid water. After that lecture, he came and hugged me. What a wonderful lecture, you know. Sri Raman had a different style. Very excitable person. For, uh, talk loudly. He said that. And then, you know, we had coffee break. In the coffee break, he said, Professor Rao, why is it India is like that, like this? I'm now 80 years old. Why is India not on top of the world? I am now 84 years old. I asked the same question. Why is India not on top of the world? Make it go on top. This is for you. God bless.